a very interesting and very interactive webinar today, and I invite you to submit your questions, type in your questions as you think of them, and I will feed those questions to our panelists. Uh, on the next slide, we'll learn about today's objectives. So we want to engage in an interactive webinar about critical sales management challenges and opportunities facing sales organizations today. And we definitely have uh, a lot of challenges to discuss. We'll walk away with uh, practical sales management best practices that can be applied to your organization immediately. Uh, and you also have the opportunity to get immediate feedback uh, from our panel of executives. Let me now introduce uh, our panel. Uh, first, we have um, Kevin Higgins. He is the president of Fusion Learning. And uh, then we have Ed Collins. He is Vice President and Director of Sales with Neopost. And then we have Nick Lisi. He is the Vice President, America's Operation of SAS, or SAS. And we have Brian Ford, uh, who is Vice President and Head of Sales, uh, Global Payment Systems, with HB, uh, HSBC. And that's uh, the world's largest local bank, uh, at least in Canada. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, panelists. And uh, let me introduce uh, Fusion Learning. Uh, I have uh, known Fusion Learning for a number of years now. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And uh, it is really an interesting, when I first learned about the company, an interesting name for a company. Because uh, when you think about what is the opposite of Fusion, um, and you know you're all in sales, Sales can be uh, disappointing at times because we don't always reach our sales goals or we don't always make our numbers and customers not uh, don't always uh, deliver on their promises and we get frustrated and disappointed. And uh, in psychology, the opposite of uh, disappointment is fusion. And the fusion is a moment where all good things come together. And uh, that is a, a really good thing. And, and here's a company that... Uh, has been concerned with improving sales effectiveness uh, for many years. And uh, we have the pleasure of um, having Kevin with us, uh, president of Fusion. And uh, in my view, it's uh, the sales effectiveness source. And uh, if a company can help you increase your sales opportunities, shorten your sales cycles, and close more profitable business. Now, let's jump right in and uh, get to the heart of the matter, which is uh, we want to talk about what does practical sales management mean to you. And uh, l let me start out by, uh, let's start with uh, Nick Lisi. Uh, what, what does practical sales management uh, mean to you? Well, thanks, Gerhard. Well, uh, simply put, I, in my mind, I think it's developing um, or adopting you know, a methodology with, uh, with clarity of objective and, and, um, and purpose. But the practical part really comes in executing the methodology and, and doing so on a daily basis. And re really, I would describe it as, you know, how does that uh, live or come alive across your organization from your metrics to your results and really into the language of your everyday uh, uh, sales force and sales processes. So, you know, that, that's what it really means to me is making it come alive on a, on a daily basis. So in, in essence, I hear you that um, you, you need to have a proven methodology, you need to have metrics as guideposts, and uh, you need to communicate constantly with your uh, team members uh, to um, execute effectively. Yeah, um, communicate and, and measure on an ongoing basis, and uh, yeah, that's exactly it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ed, uh, same question. Well, you know, I, I think that um, it means a consistent process uh, with salespeople that they can rely on, whether they're in Toronto or in Montreal or in Calgary. They'll, they know what's, uh, what's coming. And I also believe that there should be a, uh, a marriage between the technology of the CRM you adopt in your organization and the day-to-day -day coaching that a sales manager is really critical in, in their part of the, in their role. Um, so that merger is uh, is key in uh, in keeping that uh, process uh, alive and well. Uh, and and I think you you really uh, speak to the fact that we have to align and realign constantly. We have to align sales with marketing. We have to align CM with coaching. Uh, we have to align our resources with our business objectives. So um, 
I, I totally second that, and uh, and I think that's a vital part um, of uh, practical sales management. Um, Brian, um, in your organization, uh, how would you answer that same question? Thank you, Hart. I, I think with us at HSBC, practical sales management really is about establishing common sales goals that are what I'll call stretch sales goal, but they're still achievable, and most importantly, the sales goals can be measured. Uh, I think also what, what's critical is that your sales leads or your sales managers, in addition to your salespeople, have to be accountable, accountable to these sales targets. So accountability is a, a big uh, uh, a cultural element in your uh, organization so that um, everybody embraces the same value and, and aligns. Uh, uh, I mean, your, your people are very much in tune with the customer. And, and that's in your uh, your corporate uh, mission statement that uh, you want to be as close to the customer as possible. Yeah, you know what? In addition, at HSBC, we use a we use a balanced scorecard to establish these sales targets and objectives. So we create a balanced scorecard that uh, has a mix of goals that are both financial, non-financial, and then obviously for your sales team or what I'll call front line facing team, they're going to have a much higher weighting to financial targets and sales goals. Got it. Um, thank you. Um, Kevin, you want to chime in on that? Yeah, just uh, maybe one thought, there, Hart, on practical sales management. I think um, one thing that sales managers are great at is deal management, so making sure that if we've got an opportunity, they bring all the resources to bear and all the help that's needed to get it. I think practical sales management is, that's part of it, but practical sales management is more than that, which is about how do I help my people to be strategic? How do I get them to um, think about using their time both efficiently and effectively? So I would say practical sales management. Part of it is deal management, but it's much broader than that. Right. So what, what I'm hearing from all four is that uh, there are commonalities. There, there's a methodology. There are metrics. Uh, there's coaching. Uh, there is uh, alignment. Uh, then there's accountability, and there's scorecard. So we have, um, um, you know, a lot of uh, resources available to manage effectively. Now let's go to the next slide. Um, I think what what we need to emphasize here is that uh, uh, when when you look at the history and where have sales managers been before they started managing salespeople. They've been former salespeople most of the time. So the newly appointed sales managers uh, often have a hard time uh, making the transition from a doer to a manager. And, uh, and the, the manager's job is to focus on creating professional salespeople. Kevin, do you agree? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the, the one thing on this, this quote, we use this a lot. Um, it's not either or, it's and both. So we, you know, absolutely, I know folks on the phone are saying, hey, we've got to help create the sales. Yes, as long as at the same time we're creating the long-term capability of the salespeople. Got it. Now, um, l let's go to um, a survey that uh, your company has done, Kevin, uh, and we'll see the results of that survey. Uh, that and actually we have done that by uh, by polling you the audience. So this is really a composite picture of uh, your current thinking. Um, so the the number one concern is uh, how to create a great sales culture. And uh, let's um, let's drill down on a deeper level and uh, let's move on and, and and do a quick poll. Um, and, and qualify what you have said. So when you look at this poll, the sales culture at our firm is currently, uh, one would be poor, um, and two would be, let's say, you know, 25%, three would be 50%, four would be 75%, and five would be 100%, which is great. So uh, let's quickly, um, you know, look at that and, and, and click on that, and while you're doing this, um, uh, can um, uh, Kevin? Can you give me a quick example of what would be an interesting and important cultural element in in just a couple of words? Um, I think one thing on on sales culture is um, 
I, I, you know, grew up um, at one spot selling, and, and what I said there was, uh, I called it the shell game a bit. There was the, we were supposed to do 40 calls a week, mm -hmm. and so we told our management that we did 40 calls a week. Now, in reality, we were doing 10 calls a week, mm. but we were, you know, told we had to do 40. It wasn't realistic, but we had to sort of acquiesce. So one thing about sales culture, I say, is reality-based sales culture. Let's be honest. You know, what is my funnel? What is my activity level? If it's not where it needs to be, let's be let's all be honest about that. Yeah. Let's have a culture that allows that and helps people. And you you don't want to torture numbers long enough so they confess to anything. You know, right. uh, I think we we don't need to use numbers as a leverage to lie. Um, yeah. Now to our results, uh, forty seven percent of you said uh, average, and uh, and and I I think that's. Uh, uh, a, uh, a common, uh, you know, feeling that uh, companies have, but of course the the, the twenty nine plus three is thirty two percent of the companies. Uh, they are, uh, you know, really aspiring to greatness, and they're going to move higher, and they're, they're they're going to advance the profession. So, uh, uh, let me ask you a quick question, Nick, uh, because you come from from SaaS and. Mm -hmm. And I happen to know the the organizational culture. Uh, and uh, how would you rank yourself on on that scale? Um, I probably um, say we're trending towards a four. Um, okay. Typically, All right. typically SaaS has not been a, you know, it's been more of an R and D culture, um, admittedly, over over the course of our of our um, development. But um, I'd say over the last, you know, three to five years, we've really worked hard at at trying to establish, uh, you know, a more distinctive sales culture. Uh, for those elements of the business requiring it, and uh, it, we're really starting to see the fruits of our labor. Right. Now, let's move into the next slide, and, and I want you to stay with me, Nick. Um, uh, what, what actions have, has your executive team taken uh, to create a great sales culture? So you had a four, you know, probably aspiring to a five. Mm -hmm. Well, I kind of broke that break that up into three areas, and one I would say is you know kind of uh, preparing the team. Um, the second would be having a, a disciplined um, you know opportunity management and, and, and kind of sales methodology process, and then a, a very strong reward system. So let me start with the middle one. I mean, uh, we built our our opportunity management system, and Ed referred to it uh, building on on the whole uh, idea of the CRM. Uh, around formal requirements, you know, pipeline metrics, forecast, and we use it as our forecasting cycle with very, uh, you know, very specific windows and actions required that, that rolls all the way up. And so the first thing is from a discipline perspective, there's very clear understanding of, of, of how the sales force needs to, to keep the business updated. Um, and the management piece works its way around that from our, our weekly reviews and, and, and right the way up to the, to the top of the house as we, uh, as we do that. Uh, secondly, then I'll jump before, and that's preparing. Um, you know, we still do um, a formal kickoff where we bring all the salespeople together, and um, you know, we take that opportunity to do some, you know, um, informing and updating on key initiatives and training, um, and, uh, and and reinforce that with quarterly certifications on new initiatives or new solutions. Um, and more importantly, which which I find is, we do allow the sales force to come together every year at least uh, to to do some networking knowledge sharing and, 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 and quite frankly have a little bit of fun. So we set the pace for the year and then uh, we allow them to come in and, 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 and help you know get themselves sorted out for that. And then finally, you know, from a reward perspective, um, you know, we start with some, some very clear measurements. We pay for performance um, and uh, and we have some we have very competitive compensation plans. The other thing that we do though, and, and this is something that I think uh, we've seen go by the wayside unfortunately uh, but we feel very strongly is we, we do celebrate and reward the best of the best, and we do have a top performers, you know, the old President's Club or Top Performance Club. Um, and that is a huge morale booster and really makes the salespeople feel that, you know, they're a little bit um, different in how they, they strive to their targets. Um, and, uh, and then that's all supported by, you know, very strong uh, management uh, oversight and, uh, and cultural build. So that's how I kind of build out the... Uh, you know the actions that we've taken at an executive level, and that uh, we're really seeing a very strong um, um, camaraderie now. Uh, you know, over the last number of years, that's building uh, towards what we think is a you know very competitive sales force. 
Well, what I, I'd like to comment on that, I find it's really interesting that uh, all those cultural elements really add up to aligning behavior with results, and that's how you get a performance culture that's reward-based and that's also uh, professionalized because you have yeah. a, a certification program and, uh, and knowledge sharing, of, and, and you, you do it in a fun way as well. Um, I, I'd, I'd be interested, Brian, um, same question. Uh, what has your executive team t uh, taken in, in terms of action to get a great sales culture? Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, I think a couple of thoughts on this at HSBC. I mean, one is I think the, the important thing is from, from top of the house is what I'll call sales engagement from everybody in the organization. So the view of the organization that, that everyone has a client-facing role. Um, so what that creates is really what I'll, I'll, I'll look at is sales collaboration and, and teamwork kind of led by senior management by always having that external view and, and a client-centric view. So I think that's kind of critical from the top of the house to kind of create that sales culture, and, and that's what we try to achieve, you know, at HSBT. Um, we have a couple of, of a couple of processes in place, which I think are kind of interesting that we have created to making sure that we stay, you know, top of mind around creating sales culture. One is uh, we have established in our business of, of payments globally uh, a sales target operating model that really the executive has created, the executive manages. What it does, it really documents that end-to-end -end process around sales roles, responsibilities, creating that consistent model um, and consistent sales routine. So I think a lot of times your sales people, your sales managers, they want a consistent model in place. They want to understand, you know, if, if, how do I achieve this? How do I get rewarded for it? How do you measure it? So very important, creating that target operating model and making sure that we have that in place. The other one, which I, I think is really interesting that we have created, uh, is something called an oxygen partner role. Um, when we created the oxygen partner role probably about 18 months ago in, in the global payments business, and what this is is a deal coach. So ultimately we take a sales person or we take a sales manager, we take them out of the front line for a period of nine to 12 months, and they will become a regional deal coach working with the sales team in a region. So for example, uh, in Canada, a Canadian sales manager, a Canadian sales lead would ultimately become a deal coach for North America. And their goal would be work with other deal teams and other sales managers, but their role is always the role of the client to ensure that everything we do is aligned to what the client needs, the client's, the client's needs and, and requirements. So it's a very client-centric role. They do this for a period of nine to 12 months, and we bring that, that individual back into their role to take those behaviors, take that methodology, and bring it back into their team. Um, I think it's an awesome system. I wish more companies uh, were going uh, with that uh, model where you have an oxygen partner role because the deal coaches seem to inject the uh, sales oxygen into the entire organization. And the, the fact that you have built this track for the organization to run on uh, you know, shows why you're the leading bank in Canada. I want to um, pick up a couple of questions from the audience, uh, and I really appreciate you typing them in because uh, it makes it so much more fun. Um, uh, a person named Jennifer asks, um, how can you, uh, you have, can you have the panel comment on cold calling and its place in sales today? I love that question. Um, who, who would like to chime in, Ed or Kevin? Yeah, you know, I'll do it no. instead. Um, cold calling, uh, the evil of cold calling, uh, I think that uh, sends shivers down a lot of sales reps' spines. Unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, it's really a necessary part of the business, uh, but there's so many different ways of going about doing it. Um, I know at Neopost, we've invested a lot of time, effort, and money in our uh, inside sales uh, force, and what they've been able to do is open a lot of doors for our people to get into so that... Um, uh, it's more of a warm call for um, the uh, the reps on the street who are able to go in, gather as much information as possible, and then give that to uh, give that to our street reps to go out and be able to uh, do the face-to-face -face calls. So it alleviates a lot of the, um, the so-called cold calling. But in our industry, when I look at uh, Neopost, I mean, really, there's only two players in our industry, us and, and the Pitney Bowes. And we're in a role where we are chasing market share. They, uh, our biggest competitor has a, a very large market share. 
and we're chasing after it. So we have to put in place lots of different uh, methods to go after that um, that competitive base. So I still believe it's uh, it's very critical. Well, thank you, Ed. Um, uh, Kevin, do you want to chime in? Yeah, just uh, quickly. I think <clears throat> you know, cold calling. Um, sometimes what we will say to clients is the word prospecting, and it's amazing some folks turn that into cold calling. So we've started to actually use the word proactive calling. And I think anybody in sales, it doesn't matter what business you're in, you've got to be on the phone setting up meetings, setting up appointments. It doesn't matter if you're a pharmaceutical rep to a real estate person to um, high-tech sales to financial services. Everybody get on the phone and make calls. The question is, who are you making them to? And the stack ranking of proactive calling should be, you know, call your clients with an opportunity for upsell or cross-sell first, call your network, call your centers of influence. Eventually down the line, cold calling is one of the methods of proactive calling, but it's the one that should be used last. And if it's necessary in a sales role, we should be explicit about that. In our company, when we hire people, we know that they're going to have to call some folks that they don't know and don't have a connection to, um, thus cold calling. And we say to them, be ready. This is how many calls you're going to have to be making a week. And if you're not up for that, then don't sign up for the role because it's part of the role. So I think be honest about it, be clear about it, and think of it as proactive calling. Well, thank you, Kevin. And, and I want to add a little PS. I see a trend from away from call calling towards uh, what they call social calling, where uh, people now use uh, social media more aggressively and judiciously. Uh, you know, they have more connections, uh, more followers on Twitter, more connections on LinkedIn. And um, I know uh, one company that uh, gets uh, a huge number of uh, inbound leads where uh, instead of uh, making cold call calls, uh, they harvest uh, the leads that come in inbound, and and there are various uh, you know systems to do that. But um, I know one company where every sales uh, salesperson is required to blog uh, to generate leads, and they have eliminated cold calling to get all together. Now um, I I want to go back to Nick. Um, can you share a few examples of processes you have put in place? Uh, um, you, you've mentioned a few, but what what would be the um, the number one process, because if I remember this correctly, you talked about forecasting. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I like to hitchhike on that that idea. Uh, sure. What is your forecasting accuracy right now, and uh, how do you achieve that? Well, it, it's a good one, and it comes down to so to answer your question, um, you know, our, our forecasting accuracy is actually uh, is pretty good, and I would I would probably rate us. Uh, uh, at, at the business unit level at about a 75% um, rate. I mean, we have a good line of sight to what's going to close. Um, and, and, of course, our cycles are pretty long. I mean, you know, typically um, you know, in a 6 to 12-month range. So um, the executive or the sales management right down in the field have a good, pretty good view of uh, how a cycle should be progressing. Um, and how we get that is, and, and it links back into the, um, you, know, you know, this whole discussion about the calling and, and, and the prospecting and looking for new opportunity, we really start out with, with the build back at the territory level and, and, and hence we're building um, more transparency from the planning process right into the, into the territory level so that the reps have the ability to, to look and see and align what they're going to uh, take to their customers because it really is all about the customer and driving that value and, and building that into the formal plan so that, so that we can expose um, the initiatives and the resources required to achieve those targets and align those to the various stakeholders within the company, be they you know, R&D or marketing or, or, or our alliances, et cetera. After we've, we've made those alignments, then um, we do use the system to, to measure the activity from pipeline build to pipeline conversion to win rates and, and really aligning those um, uh, the metrics around whether what we've said we were going to do from a planning perspective is taking force or is really, is really getting the lift that we need in the marketplace. And, uh, and the business units are, are, are building a lot of, of, um, of good processes around them, and we're doing uh, you know, a good amount of sharing as to what's working out there and what's not. Um, and then that really gets tied up into our, our biweekly cycle, so that you know, we have good transparency right from a field level right up to uh, you know, Carl and I review um, the, uh, the pipeline and the forecast 
every two weeks uh, with each of our business unit vice presidents in our countries. And that gives you the good line of sight uh, because everything is in the repository. We're using a common currency and, uh, and, and um, you know, common elements to decide where we're going to go and how we're going to, uh, uh, how we're tracking against the metrics. So there's really no surprise from the, from right from the field level and territory planning right up into uh, how we're tracking and, and measuring the results. And that really uh, works extremely well because everyone knows what, what the cycle is, everyone knows their role in the cycle uh, as required. Well, thank you. It sounds like uh, you have a very committed uh, uh, team that uh, rarely misses their forecast. Uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, um, and we can see very clearly here that uh, the second uh, priority uh, of you in the audience, uh, you want to be focusing on developing and uh, executing a compelling sales strategy. Now, um, to uh, dig a little deeper, let's do another poll. And uh, uh, please answer the question, uh, our organization has formal, a formalized published sales strategy. Yes, no, or you can't say. And uh, we, the panelists, and uh, we won't vote. Um, Kevin, uh, what is, uh, how do you define sales strategy? How, uh, is this a, a one-page document, or is this a, a PowerPoint that um, companies distribute to uh, uh, their teams? Uh, what, what should a sales strategy look and feel like? Um, well, thanks, Gerhard. Um, you know, interesting, all organizations have a business strategy, business plan, and within that is usually a sales strategy. Um, the, the thing that we find is sometimes what happens is we end up with the sales numbers, but we don't really have the plan behind those numbers. So what I would say is sales strategy, whether it's, you know, as you said, Gerhard, it's a PowerPoint, it's a one-page document, it's, it's part of the business plan. Is there the backup to say, you know, yeah, we're going to do $300 million this year, mm -hmm. and let me be really clear how. What are the activities? Right. What's the strategy? How are we going to support that? So that's what that, that's how we would look at it. Right. Now, when you, when you look at the poll results, 46% uh, of the audience say, yes, we do have a formalized published sales strategy, and uh, the rest either can't say or they say no. And um, what, what is intriguing to me is that uh, I read a boardroom report study where they said that uh, the average top executive spends less than four hours a month on developing strategic initiatives or, or uh, thinking about a, a formal business strategy. Um, so what that really means is that the future of your company is decided in less time than it takes to complete around the golf. And, and there's something wrong with that picture. So let's dive into this. Brian, can you help us out and describe the process you've used to establish your sales strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, really for us at Top of the House, we have a sales governance committee, right? So we have a, a group that have ultimate responsibility for sales within the organization um, and also within the business segment. So I think it's, it's more than critical to have an overall sales strategy and with that is creating what that means to both your business units, what, what that strategy means to your actual salespeople and to your sales leads. Um, I mean the big thing for us is, is just creating discipline and routine, right? So, we're, so our view is it is so critical that you have between your sales managers and people, those one-on-ones, the, the sales meetings, the pipeline reviews, the reporting. And that all, that's all I would, I would say are the tactics within your overall strategy. But again, what's critical is you need to set what that goal is for the year and how you're going to get there using a very, what I consider to be a very documented process around strategy. It goes back to what I talked about earlier, what we created, what we have created, the sales target operating model, and that's what we use as our foundation for the sales team. Got it. So um, thank very you. Very structured. Uh uh, Ed, what about a Neopost? Uh, how do you uh, describe that process? Well, you know, sometimes you need help with the process. I think that's the, the first thing you need to realize. Um, I'm fairly new in the organization, uh, uh, but I come from an organization in the past that was a sales 
management sales process powerhouse. And so one of the reasons I came here was the opportunity to kind of impart some of that into, uh, into Neopost and develop a SMP, which is a sales management process. Uh, I've been given a lot of leeway from our executive committee, which has been uh, very helpful for us. But I've also looked at third parties. Uh, I've looked at people um, like Fusion to come in and not only um, help us with developing a sales strategy, but help us implement the sales strategy. And it's not just the VP of sales that's, you know, speaking down to the to the rest of the group and you must do this and sending edicts out. It's bringing in those third party people that uh, have that uh, special knowledge and the ability to impart that onto the group and also showing them how it's going to benefit them. So giving them that consistent monthly governance that uh, they'll need to do uh, to be successful. Um, now, the, the strategy is determined by your executive team, and then the execution of the strategy is, uh, is, has been created through that process of the third party. Right. Got it. OK. Um, Kevin, is it, is it a good idea? I mean, <laughs> uh, you, you're in that business um, to um, get some outside sources. And I, and I know there, there are about uh, 14 companies that, that uh, sell what I call uh, effective sales processes. And, and everybody thinks uh, their process is really ideal. Um, how do you clear up the confusion when you are a line manager, a sales manager, a VP of sales? Um, how do you shop for that ideal sales process that uh, is going to get you where you want to go? Yeah, I think uh, great question. The you know the one thing um, that we see is too often people um, are constantly changing the process. So the number one thing I would say is shop for a great partner, and when you find them, you know keep them and stay with them and work with them because um, ultimately uh, the sales organization has seen multiple different partners, whether it's on sales process or sales management process or sales system, uh, the, the long-term benefit is achieved with a long-term uh, focus and, and you know, making sure you stay with one partner. So whether that, you know, we'd love it to be fusion learning, but if it's not us, I would say to you, and we'll often say this to a client, we'll see somebody, they've got a process in place, they've been using it, and we'll say to them, you know, it's not necessarily the right thing to do to switch here. You're better off to sort of double down and stick with what you've got and, and help your people to execute it. So pick a great partner and stick with them would be my point on and, and what I hear from you is that uh, you want to have an element of consistency, that uh, you have longevity, but uh, within that uh, framework, you want to have a lot of flexibility and adaptability so you stay nimble. Absolutely. That's uh, thank you. Nick, um, I'd like to hear your views. What, what has particularly worked well uh, to align and engage your salespeople with your strategy? What, what, what tools do you use for that? Well, we've got a, a couple of processes and, and um, um, we've talked a lot about about the, you know the forecasting and that and and I don't want to make you know we I don't want to revisit that other than um, we took a lot of time out of the field um, so we made it very I won't say easy from the uh, from the art perspective but much easier from the science perspective and in, in, in other words we're not making them you know um, create a fire drill every every month when we're doing our forecasting so we can do more forecasts in less time and we think we have just a better handle on the business overall. Um, but one of the things that, 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 that we really do try to, to, to keep, I think to Kevin's point, is it, it's, it's a consistent um, and constant messaging. Um, it's not um, developing a bunch of edicts. It's, it's really driving it from, from the field up and from, from the management down and getting the, the, you know, the teams to, to, um, to really buy into the process. And if you don't change it and if you're not asking them you know, to... to, to um, recreate the wheel every 12 or 18 months. I think you get a much more measured and mature view of it because, you know, they know that's the process. They know how the strategy gets, uh, gets uh, spawned and, and, and resourced. And, and I think they, they've got a better uh, level of confidence when, when they go and deal with their customers because it's, it's, it's a much more um, um, 
you know, predictable, if you will, to the extent that it can be in our world, but um, a much more uh, uh, consistent environment. Well, I like that uh, because a lot of companies are struggling to get where you are, where you transform an organization from a reactive organization and fire drill organization to a predictive organization. Um, I, wa I want to go back to Kevin. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, you have a, a cultural uh, element in your organization that I'd like to, to comment on. Sure. So, um, you'll see on the uh, slide now a picture of two gongs, and these are actually in the Fusion office. And um, I think this is a practice that a lot of people have, which is some sort of celebration when a new deal is brought in. In our office, the salesperson rings the gong. We have a smaller one, the one in the foreground there for smaller deals, and a big one in the background there that's for the larger deals. Salesperson rings the gong, and the folks who are in the office gather around. Um, that, that may be kind of standard, but we do a couple of things that I think are, are unique. One is um, it's really a celebration more about the client than about the salesperson. It's about who is selecting us and why did they choose to work with us and what is the work that we're going to do and over what period of time and um, a little bit about their organization. That's the first thing. And I think that brings the sales and the delivery team together. The second thing we do, though, and this was actually suggested by one of our salespeople after a couple of years of having the gong, and what he said is, you know, I kind of feel like, you know, it's kind of about me and the client, but, you know, then the other people in the office have to do the work. So he said it'd be great to kind of give a little reward, and so you can't see it in this picture, but behind the gong, we actually have a little wheel that we spin, and on the wheel are $2 gift cards and $5 gift cards and $10 lunch cards. And essentially, the salesperson selects one of the member of our delivery team and says, I'd like to recognize Michelle on our team. She really helped me in this way with this client. And Michelle then gets to spin the wheel and get a little prize. And I think this does one thing, um, all of this, which is it brings together people to celebrate the fact that the business is successful, the business is growing, the sales team is working, the delivery team is supporting. And it, it creates a culture that we're all in this together. And I think with technology, sometimes we all end up in our offices and we're not gathering around the water cooler as much. So whatever we can do to create this type of culture can really help. And I know that it has a huge effect. I can tell you in our office, it's 30 seconds from the time the gong is rung till there are 20 people standing around. And it's amazing to see how quickly people can actually get there because they like that opportunity to hear about the client and to celebrate with each other. And, and I, I think that uh, hearing the gong is music to your ears. <laughs> it's, it, is, uh, it is one sound that I, that I thoroughly enjoy every time I hear it. And uh, you probably hear it every day now. Um, a, a, qu a quick question from the audience. What role does formal and observational coaching play in creating outstanding sales teams? It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, you want to try that quick? Yeah, you know, there's. I've been um, telling people this story a little bit lately, and I had someone come in recently to show me some new technology, and it's not all the way there yet, but it's pretty close. And this technology is, it's a little device that a salesperson can take with them on a sales call, and it's actually a 360-degree camera. And with permission, of course, from the client that they're seeing, um, they could put this device down and it will actually record the sales call. And I think on this, you know, formal or observational coaching, just imagine right now currently, you know, we've got to travel with them and maybe travel to a different city and, you know, go and maybe see two sales calls in the morning. Imagine your ability to have a videotape of your sales call from your salesperson that you can look at. And it actually, this technology, what they're doing is they're streaming it so that it will literally be uploaded onto the system so that you could be watching it live, actually, while the salesperson is conducting the sales It's an so, awesome, awesome technology. Yeah, uh, now, thank so you. on the... Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, of the three topics that you're most interested in exploring, we have the next one, which is help uh, Salesforce to focus their time on the highest value activities. And I think it's so important. So let's uh, drill down deeper with the audience and do a quick poll. Um, so can you please answer the question? Um, are various business processes are efficient and effective, allowing salespeople to maximize selling time? Not at all or most definitely? 
and uh, I'm, I'm so impressed uh, with uh, what I'm hearing in this uh, webinar that um, you know that you're also methodology focused and, and metrics focused and process focused and uh, you're marrying art and science in, a, in an optimized way. Uh, while we are waiting for the results, uh, uh, there is a question. Uh, is it appropriate for a regional sales office to develop a local sales strategy even if the global executives have developed it for the company? So that's, it's about um, adjusting the... Uh, uh, Nick, you have an international uh, sales operation. Uh, you're probably best qualified to answer that. Yeah, I think um, the, the way we the way we operate it is a very good question. And what we do is uh, we will find that the the ability to execute um, varies quite a bit um, depending on the local geography. I mean, in the U.S. and Canada, um, you know, there is much more clarity around the the access to resources and how you can do it. But some of the uh, Latin American countries, for instance, you know, just don't have the uh, the critical mass or the resources. So. What we ask them to do is uh, work within the framework of what we develop more at our, you know, from a theater level, from an America's perspective. Um, they're allowed, you know, they're encouraged to go out and invest in new areas where they will get some help. But ultimately, they, they do execute with, uh, with very much of a local view to what's the best thing for their market and, more importantly, um, their capabilities to deliver, you know, high-value uh, uh, solutions to the customer. Because at the end of the day, you don't want them trying to develop things that, that aren't going to bring value to the client. It makes a lot of sense, Nick. Uh, let's uh, look at that, uh, those results uh, that, um, Kevin, you want to comment on that? Um, I'm a little bit surprised. What is, what is your take on this? Well, I, I, I kind of lump the fours and fives together. So, you know, allowing reps to maximize selling, selling time really only 17% are saying that we're, we're doing that. So I think that, and I think this is an issue in sales organizations. We're asking a lot. We're asking people, salespeople to do lots of things for us. And in some of those things we're asking them to do as sales leaders, it's mm -hmm. cutting down their selling time. And that this, this, this shows that. So we have to say, do I really need them to do this? How do we make sure that technology is helping them, not hindering them? I mean, that's the, that's the big question I would put behind this one. Yeah, and there's more and more technology, Kevin, that um, I, I see companies, uh, for example, uh, at BrainShark, salespeople use 21 different um, sales applications on top of Salesforce.com. Uh, at Oxide, uh, it's now an HP division, uh, they're using about 20 different applications, and there, there's a lot of ramp-up time and learning the new application, and there's less time to train, and there's less time to coach. So mm -hmm. technology is sometimes uh, two steps forward and one step back. Mm -hmm. Yep, and, and I think you have to be judicious about that. Are we asking the question, is this value add, value creation? Is there somebody else who could do this other than the salesperson? Ed, can you tell us about uh, your top two sales processes that en enable your salespeople to maximize their time? Sure. Um, you know, I, I want to talk about something that's very, very new that we've just uh, launched this year. And as you know, salespeople are ultimately uh, responsible for the relationships that they create with, um, with, uh, with the customers. But there's so many other people in an organization that touch customers that, um, that salespeople need to rely on, and they need to have that sort of reliable feeling there. So what we've put together is one of our processes is service level agreements. So service level agreements for our back office. So when someone in leasing touches a customer, when someone requires something in credit, when someone requires something in supplies, anything that uh, uh, our people can touch a customer with, we're putting service level agreements together. This gives the sales force more comfortability and more confidence that not everything's going to be falling to them. Not all of them have to spend X amount of times delivering ink or toner or whatever to a customer when it, it'll be done internally and there's an agreement and then there's a process put together where not everything will fall on the backs of a salesperson as traditionally that, that, that happens in many, many organizations. I think the second part of that is uh, the governance calendar. A governance calendar is the processes that we put together on a 30-day basis and reps need to know, and they, you know, we've all said this, reps crave consistency. 
So they need to know when their one-on-one -on -one is, at what time the, the weekly Monday morning meetings are, what topics are going to be discussed, so what kind of value they're going to get from them so that they can plan their business month around um, what they need to do from a, uh, from a CRM perspective, what they need to do from a coaching perspective, what they need to do from a training perspective. So they still can maximize the amount of time they have in front of customers and making, uh, making money with exactly what they need to be doing. I, I like the story a lot because um, you are assisting your salespeople in, in a major way by uh, work, having the back office work on the service level agreements. And that reminds me of uh, a CEO I once worked with in Europe, and we had an executive meeting, and uh, there were all the functional managers uh, from all the departments, and he got around, uh, went around the table and asked, how many salespeople are happy because you are supporting them? And, uh, and there was silence in the room, <laughs> and it really drove home the message that uh, we better support sales in a major way in the future or we're not going to reach our goals. Well, Gerhard, it's a cultural change, too. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, Nick, same question. Um, how about uh, the top two sales processes? Well, the first thing, very much, I love that answer. Um, one of the things we we moved to, as you know, we have a very large uh, subscription. I mean, um, people have to kind of renew every year when they use our stuff. So uh, retention is very important, and we've uh, we've built an entire team that that really does nothing um, except look after uh, um, customer retention and loyalty. And so, um, you know, customer care um, is really big now on the agenda. And these teams work very closely with the sales teams to offload a lot of maybe the day-to-day -day stuff and, and really drive, um, uh, you know, higher activity levels in the accounts when the reps aren't in there, uh, you know, working on, on new initiatives. So, so that's made a quantum uh, difference in, in how we were able, more importantly, to service our customers and satisfaction goes up and, and with that, you know, so do our subscriptions. Um, the second thing, though, is, is going back to, to this whole deal of... of um, of coaching, um, you know, basically we look at, at, at doing two things. We ask our sales management uh, managers to manage revenue and to manage uh, employee development or sales development. So we've got some very good processes around deal reviews that, uh, that take a lot of um, um, mystery and time out of informal reviews of deals and processes and really allow us to sit down, um, open up an opportunity. Um, and develop action plans at various stages through the process. And that's helped free up a lot of time um, while bringing more people into, into the discussion on a collaborative you know, uh, perspective, pre-sales and services and whatnot. Um, the other thing is um, around field coaching, same thing. We have a very uh, clean methodology. We, we measure and we actually pay the managers uh, for doing a fixed number of uh, formal uh, coaching reviews uh, during the quarter on each of their reps. And again, that takes uh, the variability of it. It makes them uh, you know, very clear on what they have to hit. And uh, what we've seen over the last two quarters is uh, that the managers are now doing more uh, coaching reviews than, than the minimum. So that uh, seems to be uh, headed in the right direction. Um, Brian, you want to uh, chime in as well? Thank you, Nick. Yeah, yeah I think one, one for us, and it's, it's similar to Nick, was really around deal planning. So for us, what we have really created each sales um, manager kind of at the beginning of a quarter is going to have what I'll call top ten list uh, really based upon revenue potential and probability to actually win the deal. So we focus on creating critical account objectives for that top ten and then ultimately the sales manager, what I'll call the sales lead, is, is responsible for ensuring that salesperson um, achieves those critical account objectives within that defined period of time. And that, that depending on the account and the size, that could be within a month, could be within a quarter, could be within a year. Um, that's been a key one. I think the other one for us, which is, is, is really big, is sales training, right? So we, within HSBC, have been focused on making sure that we have sort of what I'll call annual sales training. So sales training that's customized to the business, it's consistent, um, that it's annual and it's re reinforced. And I think both yourself and Kevin talked about this earlier, but it's, from my perspective is you, you do pick a partner around training, you stick with that partner, it creates that consistent sales model as you move forward. Uh, the other key thing for us around training is 
really training for what I'll call your sales managers, what I call sales leads and your sales people, a little bit different. One's more around coaching and mentoring your sales force. The other is for your sales people, which is really more around tactics, behaviors, uh, sort of how to sell. So we're very, very focused and very consistent with our sales training program. Wonderful. It's a it's it's a great insight into HSBC, and I thank you for sharing uh, your your secrets. And I see we have we have a lot of questions. Before we get to that, uh, I want to turn this over to Kevin. And Kevin, can you explain um, on on this next slide the sales management disciplines, and and also uh, can you share with us while you go through that uh, that chart that's uh, going to be showing in a second. Um, how you can use that chart as a, as a map uh, for further improvement. Great. Thanks, uh, Gerhard. Yeah, and I think this ties back to the one question that was asked, you know, field coaching or observational coaching, absolutely one of the core sales management disciplines. And th this is not what we would say are all of the disciplines, but we would say these are four critical sales management disciplines. And the question that you can ask, and this can be different by channel or region or um, different product lines, but what is the current frequency, what's the desired frequency, and most important, what's the current quality of these that's happening? And what we would say is across the board, what you need is these to be an 8 out of 10. And you should work at making sure they're an 8 out of 10, and then you should make sure that they're at the correct frequency. And just to you know, give a quick example, team meetings, when we surveyed sales leaders, what they told us was they, they rate their sales meetings as a 6.6 .6 out of 10. And a 6.6 .6 out of 10 or 6 out of 10 is not the type of thing we want to do. How do you get it to 8? Well, a team meeting that's an 8 out of 10, two critical factors. One, it's got to have skill building. It's got to help me to perform better as a salesperson. There's got to be something in there where you're helping me to perform. And second thing, it's got to be motivational. It's got to leave me feeling more excited to, you know, hit the week than coming in and feeling like this wasn't good use of my time and I'm not excited about what I've got to do. So skill building and motivational will get you an 8 out of 10 on a team meeting. Well, I, I know that uh, your company has been very instrumental in uh, helping people improve across the board. Um, can you um, suggest to the audience here, uh, how should they prioritize um, or, or sort of get to a, a, an honest assessment what it should improve first? Yeah, I think um, the, the question earlier about observation, uh, we oftentimes are observing salespeople. We go on calls with them. We listen in on their phone calls. You know, we're, we're often observing them. It's interesting. You become a sales manager, and all of a sudden, the observation of you in action tends to dramatically drop, if not go away altogether. So what I would say is, as a sales leader, go sit in on one of your one-on-ones, sit in on a team meeting, sit in on a funnel review watch field coaching in action. Um, I actually had a conversation with a sales leader yesterday about, you know, how do, you, how do I get to see my manager doing coaching in the field and specifically how they behave when you're in front of a customer. And it actually is becoming more routine that, you know, you might have three people there. I know in the pharmaceutical business, they're now having the district manager who watches the manager with the salesperson when they're in front of a doctor. And it is overbearing in a way, but on the other hand, it really gives you a chance to see how is, how, is, how is business being conducted, how is coaching being handled. So uh, go see, go watch, and, and pick the one that you're least successful at and start making some changes on that. And, um, and, and, and that would be a course of action. Um, let me jump right in with, with some questions. We have about five minutes left here. Um, what is a reasonable expectation for the amount of time the salespeople spend on, on uh, strictly sales planning and, uh, and sales calls? Is there an optimum distribution for effectiveness? Great question, Susan. Who would like to take that? Uh, um, Ed, do you want to try? Or go ahead, Ed. Yeah. Um, you know, it really depends on the organization and the sales cycle that you're in. It depends on whether this is a transactional deal. It depends on which, if this is a solutions deal. And it also depends on how many people are involved in, uh, in the cycle. 
we have different levels of support that we can bring to bear to customers. We have a solutions group. We have a specialist for a product line. We have the sales rep. We have a senior sales rep. We have a sales manager. It's, it depends on if you want to get together and do a large account uh, management plan. So a LAMP document, uh, if it is a large enough opportunity, you're going to spend a heck of a lot more time on something that's going to be a very transactional sale. And um, I think it's the reps. Uh, we really require the rep to kind of determine what cycle that they, they uh, are in, what kind of support that they need, and how much preparation it's going to take. And that's always with the uh, help of the sales manager. That's good advice. Uh, Nick, I, I think the next question is really uh, directed to you. Uh, bearing in mind that there's a direct correlation between increased sales and client satisfaction, how important is a cutting-edge CRM system to successful sales results and client satisfaction? Um, yeah, it is a very good question. Uh, um, I think it's very important. Um, the, the caveat I would add, though, is um, you don't want to overbear it uh, or overburden it because what can happen is you become uh, really tuned to the CRM system rather than to the activities required you know, to deliver some of the satisfaction. And, and I think, um, you know, it's an important distinction because what you don't want is then is to have all of the activity, especially from the field force, on, on capturing um, versus, um, you know, being able to, to triage what needs to get done in the, in the client. And, um, um, you know, it goes back to the same principles on the sales management piece. Get a system, but then, you know, um, just the execution of, of what needs to go around it is, is really, I believe, what makes the difference. Now, this is a question that uh, is for anybody. Uh, have any of you been in the position where the supportive departments have a different strategy than the sales department, where there was a disconnect and not aligned? So uh, if so, what steps were taken to get them aligned? Sure, I can jump on that. Yeah, it's Nick. Um, I, I think that, that happens organically from time to time, especially, especially when you've got different parts of the company, you know, maybe evolving at a different pace. And what we've done basically is we use the planning, um, you know, a, a good formal uh, planning process um, as, um, as a blueprint, if you will. And now the stakeholders are, are looking both uh, for direction from that document and are inputting into that document. And that's just helping um, everybody keep, uh, keep better aligned. So communication of where we want to go and, and, and where other people can help is, uh, is really helping us stay, uh, stay aligned. Um, and the question, on that. go ahead. I was going to say, I might chime in on that as well. I mean, I think that you always want to create this collaborative team environment. But you, you're always going to have what I call a healthy tension between your sales and you know, your other sort of supporting groups within an organization. And I think that's a normal to create that healthy tension, but you just want to make sure it always remains to be right. healthy, collaborative, and, and obviously everyone ultimately is doing what's right for the client. Uh, for Brian, uh, did you have compensation issues when moving to the deal coach, uh, moving them out of the field for 9 to 12 months? If so, how did you address it? And uh, does a deal coach move uh, back to the similar role that they had uh, when they uh, the turn is over. Yeah, it's good. I would say it's a great question. Um, and I wouldn't say we've had a comp issue, but obviously what you might have is a gap within your sales team. So you'll be taking a sales person, um, a sales lead out of their role, and ultimately we, we don't necessarily fill that role until that person re returns. Generally, the person, the individual, the deal coach, re returns the role that they were in. But we've had scenarios where they have re returned actually into a bigger role because you're, you know, the organization and the team has changed in that period of nine to 12 months. But for most, uh, we create these roles. On average, we have two per region, so two in North America, two in Europe, two in Asia. Uh, and we have plenty of sales leads and managers who are very interested. The other key thing with the deal coaching is to uh, measure it. So we're very close to measuring the deals they're involved with to make sure from a coaching standpoint that the program is always effective. And to date, it, it's been extremely effective for us. Thank you. And uh, Kevin, uh, you get the last question uh, about practical sales management. When uh, managing a remote sales organization of 15 sales reps, what suggestions do you have to effectively coach this type of team, um, and particularly frequency of coaching sessions? 
Yeah, great question. So remote. Can we show the next slide too? Um, remote, 15 um, people. One of the things that, um, you know, with any of the disciplines, they are all possible by phone. So one-on-ones are possible on a one-on-one, -on -one, you know, phone call. Um, I'll tell you the thing, though, that makes them work or not work, and it's for you and the person on the phone. It is um, BlackBerry or, you know, personal device, iPad, um, and computer have to be out of your purview, and they need to be out of the coach and coachee's purview. So if we're going to have a really effective one-on-one -on -one dialogue, it's got to be where we don't have the devices going. And, um, you know, if I do one-on-ones in my office, I don't do them sitting at my computer. I do them sitting with my person. And you've got to do that on the phone. So that's one thing for remote. And with 15 people, it's a big group to manage. Um, but the disciplines are, are critical when they are remote. And so one-on-ones monthly, I would highly recommend team meetings once a month. So do your one-on-ones in the first week of the month. And yeah, it will take, you know, two full days or something or, you know, a full day, day and a half to do 15 people. Two weeks later, make sure you have a full team meeting. And again, for the team meeting, you know, devices off, computer away, let's spend 45 minutes together on the phone and make it highly interactive and call on people and, and pull people so that they're, they can't be being distracted. So definite tough challenge and, you know, um, can be done. Uh, it's a wonderful idea. Um, I have a follow-up question. Have you ever done a video uh, conference call, uh, you know, uh, around coaching? Because there's a, a new company called iMeet, and uh, they offer up to, I think, 15 different seats where salespeople can actually see each other online. And, um, you know, when people speak, then the image gets a little larger, and you, you know who is speaking, and, and you see their faces. But do you think there's any future to that, that uh, coaching and, and hiring will be done online on video? Yeah. Um, did you want me uh, to yeah. hurt? Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, we have a client we're working with right now, and they use extensive video conferencing, and they use it, you know, in multiple, in, in coaching and in managing and in, you know, connecting people. And, in fact, when we were selling to them, we had to, you know, do it to them via video conference because that's the methodology they're used to. I think this is technology that's been around a long time. I remember training the Intel Salesforce 15 years ago on that technology. They wow. had come out with it, and they were selling it. Um, I think we're getting close to where it's accessible and easy and works well right. um, and can help. It certainly worked well in the sales process that we were recently in, and we were successful, so I like video Great. conferencing. And I got a follow-up question, and the, the company name I mentioned was iMeet, I-M-E-E-T, and uh, there's another technology called Watch It Too. So Watch It Too with two O's at the end, uh, and you, you can look them up. And I, I think there's a future in, in this. Um, I uh, want to thank the audience because uh, a number of people have asked, uh, can we get uh, a, a transcript or can we, uh, this uh, presentation, this whole webinar has been recorded so it's available to everybody. And uh, other people ask, uh, will, you offer, uh, you, will you be offering other webinars around this topic in the future? Yes, definitely. And uh, we really enjoyed interacting with you. And I want to thank Nick Lisi for uh, uh, sharing a great idea on uh, ideas on collaboration, how to uh, keep a sales force on track. Uh, I, I love uh, Kevin's uh, your comments about uh, building uh, a high performing sales force, and uh, I really enjoyed uh, Brian's uh, comments from HSBC on um, uh, having a corporate culture that uh, is really uh, leading, a, a, you know, the banking industry. Uh, out of the doldrums, and a lot of banks could learn from you, um, Brian. And Ed, uh, I want to can't thank you enough uh, for uh, sharing all this information about sales processes and how you have created a winning sales organization. And I wish we could do this more often, and I hope we'll do, and we let the audience know when we do it. Kevin, you have the last word. I just thank you, Gerhardt. Um, thank you. Uh, Nick, Brian, Ed, and uh, thank you everybody on the phone. We really enjoyed our time with you and uh, always love to chat with you. Uh, Fusion Learning, our contact info is on the screen. We'd be happy to hear from you. Great. Thank you.
Thank you. Good luck to everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.